Translocation is the movement of substances, specifically sucrose, from the source, which is the leaf, down to the sink, which is the root in a plant. From GCSE, we should know that the sugars move down in the phloem and the water moves up in the xylem in general. There's also mineral ions dissolved in that water. So that's the transpiration stream. So we're gonna look into translocation in a lot more detail because it's a very involved process. And it's not just simply water and sugar movement. There's a lot more going on and we've got to look how it works. First thing we need to cover is what actually moves in these vessels. So the main thing is sucrose, that's the big thing. But you can also see other things moving in them such as amino acids, plant growth factors, often called plant hormones, even though it's a bit of a misnomer because plants don't have glands, so they can't officially be hormones. The correct term is plant growth factors. Auxin is a good example of that. We've also got messenger RNA that can move within these vessels and also viruses have been seen to be moving through these vessels as well. Before we move into the actual process, we've got to know the phloem in more detail. So this is a really nice picture just to show each of those separate things. We have the sieve plate, which is the end of the cell wall and it's been permeated with those little holes there, hence why it's a sieve. And this creates a continuous tube that fluid can move through and the sucrose is dissolved in that. Because it is hollow, the cell needs to be living because it uses a lot of active transport. So the companion cell here, either side of it, actually shares cytoplasm with the sieve tube. And that whole section is called the sieve tube element. So I've highlighted the key bits here, but I've just talked us through that, so it should be okay. But it is that living chain, the sieve tubes are elongated, they're very long cells. And the sieve plate there at the end is actually just to allow fluids to pass through. Otherwise, it'd be a blocked structure there. You're going to often see the xylem and the phloem in stuff like celery. It's the long stringy bits when you break it open. Here's another representation of it. Very similar. They've only got one companion cell shown here, though. The companion cells can circle the entire phloem. So sometimes you'll see them just as one side. Sometimes you'll see it completely circling it. And the whole thing is the sieve element. So we need to use this terminology when we're talking about each individual cell within the phloem. The sieve plate can actually trap substances upon it, such as we can see here, this red section here, that's actually slime that's building up on the sieve plate. And this really nicely shows how that companion cell works. That beaded effect there that you can see in the sieve tube member is actually the cytoplasm that's being shared with this cell here from the companion cells that are surrounding it. So we've got a couple of companion cells either side of this. Just as a little aside, that plasmodesmoda there is a small hole in the cell wall which allows the cytoplasm to seep through and keep the sieve tube cell alive. Due to this lack of organelles and the fact there's a lot of active transport going on there, the companion cell is actually stuffed full of mitochondria just to provide energy for allowing active transport growth, repair, these sort of things to occur. So mass flow itself is a hypothesis. It's not been fully proven yet, but what happens is water, which is moving in to the xylem at the base here is pushed upwards by pressure and it carries with it the dissolved mineral ions. These are slowly taken out by the cells surrounding the xylem so the water up here becomes more pure. As sucrose moves into the phloem this makes this water here less pure so osmosis occurs and draws water from the xylem to the phloem. This in turn pushes water down with the sucrose where the sucrose is removed from the cells of the phloem and taken into the companion cells where they ultimately go into the sink cells to become starch. This lowers the amount of dissolved substances within the phloem and because more mineral ions are moving in at the root here, there'll be a draw of water back into the xylem which will then repeat it. So it's a cyclical process just going round and round. Minerals going up and being removed, sucrose being added here and being removed here. So the water is flowing down here and the cycle just repeats. So it all starts in the leaf. Photosynthesis occurs and sucrose, well glucose, is made, which is then converted into sucrose, which then has to be moved into the root. This relies on a very complex process, mainly using hydrogen ions and active transport to set up a concentration gradient so the sucrose can move into the companion cell and then into the 
flow them, and then finally arrive at the sink. So you've got to break this down step by step. The first stage is energy is used to pump the hydrogen ions out of the companion cell. We are now lacking hydrogen ions in the companion cell. There's a lot of them outside, so we've set up a really good concentration gradient. The next step is those hydrogen ions will diffuse back in, which seems counterproductive because we just moved them out, but they co-transport the sucrose with it. So it basically drags the sucrose in through that specialized co-transport protein there. So we can now move the sucrose into the companion cell. From here, we now have a high concentration within the companion cell, so they can move via facilitated diffusion and the carrier protein there into the sieve element, into the phloem. This in turn changes the water potential here. The water becomes less pure. So water moves from off screen, where it's in the xylem, into the phloem, and this pushes this fluid downwards, creating a stream or a current. We can see that quite clearly here. This is a nice simplified diagram. We've got the source making the sucrose and it's moving into the phloem and water is moving out of the xylem to push that fluid down. So I've created a flow diagram to help with this. It's quite a detailed thing. So the first stage there is the hydrogen ion has been pumped out. Second stage is the co-transport back in with the sucrose. Then you've got the higher concentration of cells, so the facilitated diffusion. This then changes the water potential, makes it more negative, so water moves into the phloem. The water then has increased pressure because fluid is being forced into it, so this pushes it away from the cell and it finally arrives at the sink where it moves in to the sink cells via a combination of diffusion and active transport. The water will then move back to the xylem because the xylem has now got more dissolved ions in it due to the fact they're absorbing them from the soil. Okay, so I've tried to draw a very simplified diagram of this. I know it's a bit blocky, but bear with it. So the first stage is water and mineral ions are drawn in here. That drawing in of water via osmosis pushes water up the xylem and it'll eventually arrive at the top of the plant where the ions will be drawn out into the surrounding cells at the top. This creates that change in water potential, which means water is drawn towards where the water is less pure in the phloem, because in the phloem, sugars are moving into it from the source. This in turn creates a push of water down due to that hydrostatic pressure, and the water will head down towards the sink cells. The first stage that occurs in the sink is the sucrose is drawn into the sink cells via facilitated diffusion. So it is a passive process because there's a high concentration of sucrose in the phloem, lower in the cells surrounding it. As we get further down the route, all the sucrose is being removed, we end up with a low concentration. So here, active transport has to take over to pump those remaining few sucrose molecules into the sink where they'll be converted to starch. This changes the water potential, so the water moves back into the xylem, and that in turn then pushes the water up the xylem and the cycle repeats. So a few more things just to cover quickly. First thing is cross-section of the stem and the root. It's the location of the xylem and the phloem within both of those. So on the left-hand side there, we've got the stem, and on the right-hand side, we've got the root. And you can see the phloem is actually quite close to the surface on the stem, where it's deeper in the root. What happens if you cut into a tree? It can actually ooze sap from the phloem. It's also why ringing is so dangerous for a plant, because if you cut a strip of bark all the way around a tree quite deeply, it can actually kill it. And there's some experiments people have done to try and prove the mass flow theory. One of them is this girdling here where you ring the tree, cutting deep into it, so you actually go into the phloem. And what happens is over time, the top of the cut there starts to bulge as material starts to build up and when that material is examined it was found to contain starch so what the plant's doing is trying to move it to the roots but because the phloem has been cut it's converting it to starch where it can get it to which happens to be just above that cut 
Other things that have been used to try and prove the mass flow theory is the use of radioactive labeling of carbon. So they radioactively label carbon dioxide and then they expose the plant to it and they could trace it using auto radiographs. The pictures here really show this clearly. You can see that the bottle here has been placed over this leaf and it contains radioactive carbon-14 in the carbon dioxide and they did a series of auto radiographs and the first bit that contained the radioactive material was the leaf then over some time it was the leaf and the stem and then finally it was the leaf the stem and the roots so it's quite a nice little simple representation of it that shows quite clearly how the carbon can be converted into the sugars which can then move through the leaf and ultimately into the roots and this is the actual slides they did they exposed two areas to it here and also here and you can see that over time the radioactive material the radioactive carbon went through the stem and into the roots so it's a really nice representation of it very logical experiment when you sort of understand what it's showing and you can trace the source to the sink and just evidence to support this, I tabulated this freeze. This is the sort of thing you have to do in a six mark question where they ask you to provide evidence or critically evaluate something, in this case, mass flow theory. So for it, when you cut into it, it oozes sap, it doesn't draw it in. There's more sucrose found in the source than in the sink because it's being converted to starch and also that's where photosynthesis is occurring. And also viruses have been seen to move down towards the roots so they're sort of going with the flow in the phloem but the problem is there's some evidence to show against this such as amino acids travel more slowly than sucrose and they should if it's just a flow theory all travel roughly the same speed and also some people have claimed there's seen substances moving against it anyway that's all done enjoy <laughs>